Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Berachot, Chapter 1, Halacha 5, Part 2 of the Shear. And today we're going to be getting into how the, the Kohanim were doing the Shema blessing in the temple. And we're going to get a little bit into the prayer before we learn Torah. And we're going to have a very exciting finish today where we get into the Shemona Esrei and saying extra prayers during the Shemona Esrei. And it's going to seem very basic to you, but actually there's a lot of depth to it. And when you when you really uh, think about it deeply, you're going to see that there's there's a lot going on. You know, there's a saying that still waters run deep and it's one of these kinds of things. It'll it'll seem very obvious on the surface, but when you dig down, you're going to see that really there's a lot of ideas in there, and I'm really excited to share it with you. So let's get going with the with the Gemara, and the Gemara is going to return to this discussion that we were having in the Mishnah in Tamid, which is talking about what the Kohanim were doing for the praying, what they were saying, and and it was covering this, you know, repeated part in the in the Shmona Esrei. So the Gemara says the appointed one would say to the Kohanim, recite a single blessing, and they would recite the blessing. And which blessing did they recite? Rav Masna said in the name of Shmuel, it is the blessing upon the Torah. That basically is saying the pre-Shema blessing, the Ahava Rabbah, that's this, this blessing of eternal love, of, of profound love, is essentially a blessing on the Torah. Now, we were covering yesterday that hidden inside the Shema in order is actually the Ten Commandments, and it goes in order. It's not jumbled up. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in order. And that's in the Shema when you say it. And what's amazing about it is the Yershalmi points out each part of the, the Ten Commandments. It doesn't just say it's Ten Commandments. It actually walks you, it grabs your hand and, and, and makes you look and see and walks you through it. And over here, they're doing another part where they're saying that, you know, before you learn Torah... That you say a pre a pre learning blessing on the Torah, and it's very important to do because you don't want to take Torah learning for granted, and that's a very serious thing that came up with with one of the prophets. One of the prophets, uh, Irimahu, was was complaining to the people that uh, they were taking Torah for granted, and and the Maforshim explained that it was it was a statement that. They were learning, but they weren't appreciating what they were learning. So they were kind of stagnating in spiritual growth. So it's really important to to learn Torah, but to try to ask and to try to do it with sweetness. You wanna you wanna always pray to Hashem that you're gonna learn Torah with sweetness. And in the morning bracha, when you when you you know after you you know wash your hands and after you put on your tzitzis, the morning bracha on learning Torah has a has a term for sweetness in there so it's very important to try to do that and they're basically saying here that before they said the shema implicit in there is a blessing for the torah and learning the torah and that's a really key idea now the gemara is going to ask but did they not recite the other pre-shema blessing yotzer hamaros in other words that's the statement that you say in the morning that you know where it says you know, who forms the lights. And that seems to be a good question. You know, how come these people, these Kohanim who are getting ready to do the morning service, are they saying that part of the Shema? And the Gemara is going to answer and says, Rabbi Shmuel, the brother of Rabbi Berechia said, at the time that the Kohanim recited the Shema, the lights had not yet emerged and there was insufficient light to recognize one's fellow, and and you say that they should recite the Yotzer Hamaros, the prayer for who forms the lights. So basically, they would 
it's basically saying they were not able to recite it at that early hour because how can they recite it because the lights didn't come out yet. So there's a lot going on here. You know, the Kohanim of the Mishmar, that's the, you know, the times of the, of the service of the watches were split up. And, you know, they were serving in the temple and they recite the Shema before the main time for its recitation arrived. And one of the ideas about that is that, is that um, they would just say the Ahava Rabbah, which is a statement of learning Torah and the Shema at an early hour, and they would recite the blessing of, of the, you know, the statement of who forms lights, and they would do that uh, only after enough light came out where it was relevant. In other words, if you're doing it too early where the lights didn't quite come out yet, and it doesn't make any sense because why are you blessing something that didn't happen astrologically yet? So we're learning that it is not essential to recite the blessings in the usual order in the case of the Bet Hamikdash. And why would that be? Because the Kohanim are involved in the mitzvah. And we know that you don't have to interrupt a mitzvah to go do another mitzvah. So there, you know, there's a there's a point about that. So the Mara Fulda, the great Yershami commentator, adds about this, comments about this idea that the blessing of uh, Yotzer Hameros is not inherently associated with the Shema, but it was instituted to praise Hashem for his illuminating the world on a daily basis. And the sages ordained that it should be ordinarily recited before the Shema, because the Shema itself is recited when the daylight emerges. And since the Kohanim of the Temple recited the Shema earlier than that, there's nothing wrong with the postponing of that blessing until later in the day. So um, there's another comment by the Mara Fulda about this. He's saying that this is why Rish Lakish, when seeking to prove out that the blessings are not essential to the Shema recitation, inferred from this fact that the Kohanim were allowed to make an interruption between Ahava Rabbah and the Shema, and not from their omission of the Yotzer Hameros. So the omission is, says the Mara Fulda, not remarkable since the time for that blessing did not yet arrive, and the blessing is not inherently associated with the Shema. So Rish Lakish, says Mara Fulda, considered it remarkable only that they did not follow Ahara. Ah Ahava Rabbah, with an immediate recitation of the Shema itself. He continues and says that the Ahava Rabbah is directly related to the Shema in as much as it is a blessing on the Torah, and the recitation of the Shema is essentially a form of Torah study. So yes, it has passages from the Torah in it. Not only that, as we learned yesterday, it's, it's structurally a form of the statement of the Ten Commandments. And so if you're going to be learning Scripture, you have to say a blessing on the Torah because you're learning something. And because it's using, I mean, what Mara Fuld is pointing out is that because you're using all these scriptural verses in there for the, for the statement after the Shema Israel part itself, that you have to say something before because it's effectively learning Torah as well. It's not just a prayer, but you're also learning Torah, and you have to always be appreciative of Torah and of Torah study, and that's why you always want to say a statement like that. So the Gemara is going to talk about this final clause of the Mishnah from Tamid, and it says, On the Sabbath, besides the usual recitations and blessings of the temple of the Kohanim, by the temple Kohanim, Gemara says they would add one extra blessing for the outgoing Mishmar to recite. So let me explain that. So each Mishmar of the Kohen, they served in the temple for one week at a time, and they would rotate. And the changing of the watch took place every Shabbat. And then what would happen is the outgoing Mishmar, that's the watch, they would perform the morning service, which would include the Tamid, which is why it comes up in, in Masechet Tamid. 
And then the Musaf offering and the incoming Mishmar would perform the afternoon services. So the uh, afternoon to me, uh, that's what the, the, the new... Um, the new Kohanim would do, and they would also do the offering of the two spoons of the of the Levona on the on the shulchan on the table. So, what would they say? What did they add to this extra blessing? And you're going to see something very beautiful, very deep, and something to inspire all of Am Yisrael. What did the sages institute that one Kohanim group of Kohanim who was leaving the watch? and welcoming the next watch. They didn't just come in like robots, do their job and leave. No, they instituted something to bring heart into, into each person and to you know circumcise the heart and to make sure that we have a heart of flesh and also to inspire you and me. And what did they say? The Gemara asked, what is the extra blessing that the members of the outgoing Mishmar would recite? And the Gemara answers and says, Rabbi Hilbo says it is the following. The outgoing Mishmar would say to the incoming Mishmar, May the one who dwells in this house plant among you brotherhood, love, peace, and friendship. Wow, what a blessing. That's really, really beautiful. And this blessing is really unlike others, and it's really you know, uh, uh, a praise to Hashem, and it's also a praise to have, you know, Ahavat Yisrael, brotherly love for Israel, and to help to, um, you know, to to limit uh, jealousy because these people were in, uh, serving in the in the Ben Hamikdash, and now they don't get to anymore, and so maybe some people could feel a little bit of jealousy or maybe a little bit of sadness. And they institute it in a way to make sure that when you're blessing your fellow, you're doing it in a way where it's going to give you joy and happiness. And it's going to help to, to give context in this transferring of the guards, so to speak. And, and it's really you know trying to make sure that the people regard each other as brothers and that this structure and prayer is trying to do an expression of good wishes. And it's something that's beautiful, and it's talking about love and peace and friendship. And it's something that, you know, we should try to internalize for ourselves when we're doing something where we're helping out or transferring something to a fellow Jew. We have to elevate our, our, the way we, we manifest this and internalize it and see it, where we're seeing the other person with, with love and like a brother and, and wishing them peace and friendship. And the Gemara is now going to talk about this uh, ruling for, for Ahava Rabbah, this, this, this statement of love in Torah. And Shmuel says in the Gemara concerning one who rises early in the morning to study Torah, if he studies before his recitation of the Shema, he must recite the blessings upon study of Torah. And the Gemara continues and says, but if only after but if he studies only after his recitation of the Shema, he need not recite the blessings upon the study of Torah because he has exempted himself through the recitation of the Ahava Rabbah. In other words, what, what this is saying is this is saying that, look, if, you know, we have a commandment that we have to engross ourselves in the words of Torah, okay? And we also have a statement that, you know, Hashem... Uh, selected us from all the peoples and gave us Torah. You know the 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 rest of the nations don't have mitzvot. The rest of these mitzvot. The rest of the nations don't have this kind of holiness. They have a kind of holiness, but it's smaller. They don't have this, and they don't have Torah and Torah learning. And and so there's an idea that we have to. We have to safeguard the Torah. We have to safeguard the teachings of the Torah. And what better way to safeguard it than to put on a regular blessing before you learn the Torah? So what what Shmuel is saying, uh, Shmuel is saying that you know if you're going to study before saying the Shema, you have to say the blessings on the Torah. But 
if you're going to study after you say the Shema, you've already covered it by the recitation of the Ahava Rabbah. That's basically what he's saying. Now, they're going to clarify and sharpen Shmuel's uh, ruling and, and refine it a little better. And Rabbi Ba said, this applies only if he studies Torah immediately. So what, what this is saying, this is basically saying, says the Haredim, that since the Ahava Rabbah was instituted primarily as the blessing for the Shema, rather than for general Torah study, it can be relied upon as a blessing for Torah only if one actually follows it with Torah study. By contrast, one who utters a regular blessing upon Torah discharges his obligation to make these blessings even if he's unable to study Torah until much day later in the day. So that's a that's a key point. In other words, they're saying that if you're early in the morning and you're stu going to study Torah and you say the Shema first, and then you open the book and you start learning, you've covered it. But if you're not doing that, and then you have to go out, you have to get your coffee, you have to go get your groceries, you have to go get your eggs for breakfast, you have to get this, you have to get something for your wife or your kids, and then, you know, a few hours later you're coming to learn, now you got to go say the regular blessing on learning Torah. But in some cases, the Ahava Rabbah will cover it, which is a beautiful idea and a beautiful thing. So now we're talking about these blessings on the Torah, and the, the Gemara is going to give a lot of opinions about which portions of the Torah recite you need these blessings. In other words, which are going to be these portions of the Torah that you have to say the blessing before the Torah study? So they want to clarify that. They're going to say, okay, you got to say a blessing before Torah study. But now they're going to answer and say, well, what counts as Torah study? Does this count? Does that count? So let's get into it. Rabbi Huna said, it seems most reasonable that when one studies expositions of scripture, he is required to recite the blessings upon the Torah. So expositions of, of scripture, I mean, that's literally, you know, we're, we're reading, um, you know, pieces of the Torah. And that's basically what the, all the statement after Shema is. So Rabbi Huna is saying that, yeah, it's, it's reasonable that you'd have to say it because you're, you're reading parts of the Torah. And by the way, you're not a robot. You're a human. You're flesh and blood. You might learn something or see something new in that recitation. And therefore, it's necessary for you to, to have a statement of Torah learning just before which is why the sage is instituted Ahava Rabbah. Now, keep in mind, the sages have the ability to put up a fence, and we are always required to safeguard the Torah and to perform the, 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 the you know, to perform uh, acts to try to, you know, teach Torah and fulfill the words of Torah. And so it makes sense that they could put up a fence to help to safeguard, you know, Torah and, and, and to give kavod to Torah learning. So, so he says, Rav Huna says, it seems most reasonable that when one studies expositions of scripture, he's required to recite a blessing on the Torah. That seems to make a lot of sense. But then he says, but when one studies oral laws, he is not required to recite a blessing. Now that seems to be a very big chiddush. Now that is going to, is uh let, let's talk about that. So the Mara Fulda, because it's a it's a shocking statement. The Mara Fulda is going to say like this. He's going to say that the term uh, about expositions is going to re refer to scriptural expositions of a halachic nature, like those found in the Mechilta or the Sifra or the the Sifre, and um, these uh, sorts of, of midrashim by the way, shouldn't be confused with other collections talking about stories that you have in like Midrash Tanhuma or Midrash Rabbah. When you're learning the Mechilta or the Sifra, for example, it's talking about more halakhic things and the other ones are more story oriented or helping you to understand the Mikra better. So it's a little bit different. The tool, It's different tools in the toolbox, basically. So 
The Mara Fulda is pointing out that Rav Huna holds that the blessings upon the Torah are required for the study of the written law, but not for the study of the oral law. However, the studying of expositions of scripture from which the laws emerge is tantamount to studying scripture itself. Therefore, this study must be preceded by blessings upon the Torah. And the Mara Fulda continues, says, according to, the, to Rabbi Huna, one who studies only oral laws, including the Mishnah and the discussions in the, in the Gemara, are, it is not required to recite the blessings of the Torah at all. So what Mara Fulda says is he's speaking even of one who did not yet recite the blessing of Ahava Rabbah. Okay? So there's going to be a dissenting opinion, obviously. And Rabbi Shimon said in the name of Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi, whether one studies expositions of scripture or oral law, he is required to recite the blessings of the Torah. Now, I'm not saying that Rav Huna is wrong here. I'm saying that perhaps uh, Rav Huna is, um, is, is talking about a different, a different thing about the oral law. In other words, he's saying that, you know, perhaps all of this takes place and before uh, even the light comes up. So perhaps you could say that, you know, he's still getting credit from the earlier day or something like that. So I'm not saying that he's he's necessarily wrong. And perhaps, you know, if he's, if he's you know, studying oral law uh, before all of that, perhaps it wouldn't count because it's like, you know, saying the Shema up until that light. Now, that would be a Doraita thing, not necessarily a Darabanan thing. But perhaps what, you know, he's talking about is he's saying, like, look, you're already getting credit from an earlier day. So rather than just say, he's right, he's wrong, he's right, he's wrong, and these drama things, there, there might be more subtle things coming up. And perhaps what Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi are talking about is something that, you know, is what you can recognize as the next day. And so perhaps Rabbi Huna is talking about something that, that might be on a different part of the day. It's just a guess. Um, I prefer to find another way to uh, try to reason with it or, or explain it rather than just say that uh, this one is just stom wrong, it's just flat wrong. They might be, a, uh, this might be in here also to teach us something about um, other parts and nuance of, of these laws that's that's very common uh, in the Gemara. So in talking about the the part by Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi, the oral law is a discussion of the law and the the Gemara it debates uh, practical Torah and it's also explaining the Mikra, in the Torah itself. So the Gemara and the Talmud is an essential part of learning, and the oral law is an essential part of the Torah. It, it is the Torah, and you can't you can't just do, you know, quote unquote, you know, Bible Judaism, you know, like like some people would imagine. Um, there's no such thing as quote unquote, you know, Bible Judaism. It's mistaken, it's wrong, uh, it's it's based on you know ignorance and no learning. It's impossible to do, you know, the Gemara, I'm sorry, the, the Torah will issue certain commandments and it'll say, oh, you know, on the eighth day, you cut the or law of the baby. Well, where is that? Is that, you know, a lock of your hair? Is that the earlobe? You know, is that a fingernail? What, what is the or law? So you can't put it together without the, the oral law. It is the Torah. They're both the Torah. So the, the part about what Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi is saying is that is that um, is that um, you know he's saying that you're 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 citing where you're saying the the scripture and you're citing where you're saying also these these rules in the Gemara and um, the the uh, I want to I want to look at what the Rashi is saying here in Bavli in in uh, Berachot page eleven eleven uh, B. He's saying that there's four opinions on this matter. Rav Huna holds that 
There is only one recitation of the actual scripture verses uh, that recites a bless and that you know of the actual scriptural verses that require a blessing, but the stu study of scriptural uh, expositions does not. That's one opinion. Um, Rabbi Elazar holds that both scriptural verses and scriptural expositions call for a blessing, but the study of Mishnah does not. Rabbi Yochanan holds that even the study of Mishnah, which contains the essence of the oral law, requires a blessing, but the study of the Talmud, which contains analysis of the Mishnah, does not. And Rava holds that even the study of uh, the Talmud requires a blessing. And, and uh, the other point here is that the Gemara basically here is only talking about the second and fourth opinion, and Rabbi Huna's ruling is basically going to match up with Rabbi Elazar's ruling in the Bavli, and Rabbi Shimon's uh, ruling is going to be with Rava's opinion in the Bavli, and the only difference there is that Rabbi Shimon uh, here is, is substituting uh, Halachot, and Rava over there is saying Talmud. So that's a little bit about this. Now let's take a look at at what the um, what the Haredim says, saying that the halacha is that whether one studies scripture itself, expositions of scripture, Mishnah or Gemara, he must first recite the blessings of the Torah. And by the way, that's going to be the the same as in the Or Chaim chapter forty seven halacha two, where they also say that the it also uh, applies to homiletic midrashim. So, like, if you're just studying in in midrash Tanhuma, some of the stories that are out there that are not necessarily an in-depth uh, study of of the mikra or explanations of how the mikra is written, or something that had might have some halakhic ramification, they're saying that just these sorts of stories. Uh, that are like uh, homilies that that um, that you also need to 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 make a blessing on that says the Or Chaim. So there's um, so that that's going to be what the law is today, and that you know basically anything that you're doing on any subject or any topic uh, topic, you're you're going to be uh, you're going to be uh, doing that. Now having discussed. The Shema and what the Kohanim are doing at the Mishmar in the Temple, the Gemara is going to turn to the, the the Shema of another group in the Temple. So it was taught in Abraisa, one who recites the Shema in the morning together with the men of the uh, Mamad has not discharged the obligation because the men of the Mamad would recite it too late. So we covered this before. The 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 people in the Mishmar, they would recite the Shema earlier, okay, earlier than than uh, before, because you know they're they're basically involved in you know getting ready to do a mitzvah, and you know they might not have another chance later in the day to say the Shema, so the the men of the Ma Mamad. Uh, they did not. They were not involved in the entire, you know, service of the temple. So, you know, they would they would delay their their statement of the Shema until after the Tamid was offered. Now, I want to point out uh, something for from uh, the Ramban on this. The Ramban uh, in in talking about his his uh, his. His note in um, in in Bavli eight B of Berachot, the Ramban says like this, but the parallel idea is here as well. The Brisa does not mean that the men of the Mamad uh, did not discharge their obligation at all. It is inconceivable that they would have neglected the Torah's commandment to recite their Shema in its proper time. And the Ramban says, in any case, the Tamid service did not extend until. The end of the third hour, which is the final time at which the morning Shema could be recited, so that they were able to recite the Shema within the proper time after the Tamid service was completed. Rather, the Baraisa means that they did not discharge 
their obligation in the optimal manner, which is to recite the Shema at sunrise. It's a very, it's a very good point. So the there's going to be a related incident, and Rabbi Zera says in the name of Rabbi Ami in the times of Rabbi Yochanan, we used to go out to recite the special prayers in the town square on fast days. So we know about this in the Mishnah and Tanis in chapter 2, and it teaches that uh, when it is necessary for a community to declare a fast on account of some sort of problem, they would gather together in town squares. Now, the, the Haredim points out about this that the Shliach Sibor would recite a special 24 blessing Shemona Esrei consisting of the usual 18 blessings and six additional ones uh, containing prayers for God's deliverance, for Hashem to deliver us from this danger and to, and to help us. And the Gemara continues and says, and we would recite the Shema after the first three hours of the day had passed when the time for his recitation was already over and Rabbi Yochanan did not protest this practice. So the the Haredim says about this that um, the reason that the people actually recited the Shema privately, uh, that you had the people that they would recite the Shema privately before they gathered in the town square. So they discharged their obligation in the, in, in the right time, but they repeated the Shema uh, in the community only for the sake of pre uh, prefacing their, fa their prayer with the recitation of the Torah passage. So in truth, there could still be room to object for the to object to this practice since unlearned people could have inferred mistakenly that it was acceptable to recite the morning Shema at that late hour. And the Haredim points out that Rabbi Yochanan actually dismissed this concern and allowed the practice to proceed. Many times in the Gemara, um, they're going to reject something if, if the community that's there uh, is filled with unlearned people or the community doesn't really have Torah scholars who can guide the community, then it's very easy for the people to get mixed up because they don't know the laws and they don't know how to protect the ordinances. And so uh, a lot of times they won't allow that. But perhaps Rabbi Yochanan did not protest the practice because uh, in this place where they were, there were a lot of Torah scholars that were there so that people wouldn't get confused. So that's something to keep in mind that, you know, it, it's, it's about context and it's about who's asking the question. And when you have cases of, uh, you know, communities that would come to Eretz Yisrael to ask opinions and they were not, you know, from Bavel and they were not from Eretz Yisrael and they were from some place, you know, maybe in Syria or Turkey or something, uh, or maybe, you know, the other side of the Euphrates River, where it's known that, you know, maybe there were people that didn't really have much Torah out there, that uh, they would they would not allow certain things that, that could, could have a Morris Ein problem. It's very important to pay attention to Morris Ein because you don't want to mislead people. You're not allowed to mislead people. And... You know, you have to be careful if you're around people that are that are not learned about Torah. You have to be very careful about your observance. You have to be very careful to guard your eyes. You have to be very careful in how you speak to these people and how you represent Judaism because you might mislead them and, and change their practice and they, they might get the wrong opinion out of ignorance. So you have to be very careful. So there's another story in this same sort of approach. And Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Acha once went out to recite the special prayer in the town square on a fast day. And the congregation came and recited the Shema after the first three hours of the day had passed. And Rabbi Acha wanted to protest that practice. And Rabbi Yossi said to him, but they already recited the Shema in its proper time. And the Gemara says, uh, do they recite it now for any reason except to stand in prayer upon having been occupied with the Torah passage. And basically, it's saying, you know, why should you object to this practice? In other words, they're, they're saying that, that, you know, why should you object? 
And Rav Acha replied and says, it is because of the concern of error by simple, unlearned folk who might not realize the reason for the current recitation of the Shema. And he's basically saying that the practice must be stopped. And the Gemara says, so that they should not say that the congregation is actually reciting the Shema in its proper time, which would basically confuse them and lead them to the wrong conclusion that you're allowed to say the Shema at a time of a very late hour. So again, how you're practicing as a religious Jew um, is, is very important. Uh, but, you know, again, the other thing that Rabbi Yossi is taking into, a, into account is that, you know, they must be in an area where there's enough learned people and Torah scholars so that they can they can correct or guide any mistaken ideas. Now, Rav Acha would be 100% right if they were living at this time in one of the, you know, far off communities like in Turkey or something, then yeah, you know, they wouldn't be allowing this because, you know, there's no there's no Torah scholars up there. There's no Torah scholars, you know, up in the Lebanon and, and Tarsus and these sorts of areas at this time. There's no, you know, it's just a bunch of Hellenized Jews or it's just a bunch of people that are out there for business and they're very disconnected to Judaism and, you know, they're going to get the wrong idea. So in one case, Rabbi Yossi is right. And in another case, Rabbi Acha is right. But the answer is it depends, depends on the context. But for you and for me, what we have to get out of it is we have to get out that, hey, you know, if you're going to Tel Aviv and you're going to be doing something that, you know, only a real Torah scholar would understand how something is, but, you know, it could be misunderstood, you're not going to be allowed to do it because there's not enough Torah scholars, unfortunately, in a city like that to, to correct the people um, in a place where there's a lot of Torah scholars, like in Jerusalem, you'd be allowed to do it as long as you weren't allowed you weren't, you know, around unlearned people or that the people that were there had access to, to Torah scholars in their community. I don't know what this, you know, other uh, thing would be. I'm just giving you an example as a principle. So the Mishnah states in a place where the sages said uh, to make a lengthy blessing, one may not recite a brief one. Now, we're going to get into a very beautiful um, idea coming up about the Shemona Esrei and adding your blessings to it. And this is really a basic idea, but actually ends up being uh, very profound and, and have a lot of depth to it. So we're talking about in a place that the sages said to make a lengthy blessing, one may not recite a brief one. And the Gemara is now going to give, um, you know, talk about, you know, relative lengths of different blessings. So Kamar says, which are the blessings in which we are permitted to recite a more lengthy text than that which the sages composed? The blessings of the Shemona Esrei of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the blessings that the leader of the community adds to the Shemona Esrei on the fast day and from a person's uh, personal recitation of blessings, it can be discerned whether he is a Torah scholar or an uh, ignorant person, in, in ignoramus, which are the blessings. So now it asks, it says, which are the blessings in which we are required to preserve the brief text that the sages composed? And the, the law applies to one who recites the blessings upon mitzvot, or upon other foods, and to the blessings of the Zimun, and to the final blessing of the Birkat Mazon following the meal. So let's start to unpack this and, and get into it. Now, this Brisa uh, also appears in the Tesefeta in chapter 1, uh, Halacha 8, but uh, the sequence of the clause is a little bit different. Uh, anyway, so in Here's what the Haredim says about this. He says that the lengthy blessings of the Musaf prayer of Rosh Hashanah were also recited at Musaf on Yom Kippur of the Yovel year, 
And this is the blessing of Yom Kippur to which the Brisa refers. And one is permitted to add to the text of these blessings by inserting additional verses over and above the ten verses that are basic to each blessing. And that's what the Haredim is implying about this. There's other people like the Mara Fulda who are saying that this Bryce is referring to all the blessings of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And, and the meaning on it is that, you know, on those days we insert uh, supplications of remember us for life. And, and, and um, the, so that's one way uh, to look at which are these extra blessings. Now, keep in mind, the, the blessings in the Shemona Esrei were composed by the, the, men, the great men of the assembly. These are the people who came back with Ezra. And, you know, there was many prophets who helped to compose it. And also the other blessings are ancient as well. And some of them have some texts that were uh, modified by the sages. But um, the we're going we're gonna to point out you know, which part is which. So, um, so the, the Mara Fulda says about this, that the, uh, that on fast days, it was customary for the Shliach Sibor to add six blessings to the Shemona Esrei prayer. And he inserted them after the blessing of Redeemer of Israel. And nowadays on fast days, the Chazan, inserts one additional blessing after answer us, uh, after Redeemer of Israel. So uh, that's, you can see there, that's going to be a change for what happened nowadays by the, by the sages from what was before. And that uh, there's a basic text for each of these six blessings, which is each going to be very lengthy. You can see more about that in Masechet Tanis in chapter 2, and that's going to be in Halakha 2, and and the, the Baraisa is going to be teaching that, uh, you know, the Shliach Sibor is permitted to, to further lengthen a text by inserting any of the appropriate uh, prayers. Now, the Rambam has a lot of explanation about this sort of flexibility about adding to the prayers in Hilchus Tanios in chapter 4, Halacha 5. And so you have a lot of things going on here with the prayers. Some of the prayers are with Ezra and the prophets. That's in the Shemona Esrei. You have some that were from an earlier time from the sages, and you can find that in Tanis. And you can find some of the changes that happened uh, later on that is for a, uh, a more modern uh situation of Eretz Yisrael, and you can find an ex a good detailed explanation on how this works from the Rambam in Hilchus Tanios, in chapter 4, where he goes through and walks through how each part of it functions, if you're interested in more information on it. Now, uh, on the part for whether he's a Torah scholar or he's ignorant, you know, if he's adding uh, prayers you know, where one is authorized to do it, like what the Rambam teaches you how to do in Hilchos Tenios, you can see that this person's a Torah scholar. Uh, that's what the Pnei Moshe says. And the Pnei Moshe also says that uh, if he adds uh, to the blessings whose text is fixed, he is obviously an ignoramus. Now, the... Uh, that's a key point about saying the Shemona Esrei as well. You want to you wanna really stick to the text in the Shemona Esrei for your own personal prayer uh, for, for how it's structured. And then when it gives you an option to add to you know, the prayer for what the sages allowed for a personal thing for health, that's where you do it. That's the appropriate time to do it. And the part where you're asking for acceptance of prayer that's an, a, that's an appropriate time that the sages put, uh, even back from the time of, of Ezra and, and the prophets that helped to compose this, that that's where you can either ask for forgiveness and make tshuva, or you can ask for help for parnasah. And then at the very end, there's going to be a place for personal prayer. 
like if you want help for your children and you want help for, uh, you know, for your neighbors to, you know, to be more quiet at night, things like that, you know, and you want help for, you know, success in your, in your business venture or whatever it is, more success in your learning. That should be the first thing you pray for is more success in your learning. But anyway, those things go come at the end, and and you can see in the in the prayer book it'll it'll give you a note on where it is. And basically, what they're saying is they're saying that the Torah scholar is adding at the right time, and the ignorant fool is adding just whenever. So even if he's saying the Shema and he's adding all sorts of stuff and all at the wrong time, it's it's uh, it's not the best way to do it. And, you know, in life, everything is about timing. And, you know, there's a timing in, you know, every how everything works in the heavenly courts. And we can see that in the creation of the first seven days that everything is built with timing. This comes and then that comes and then that comes. Everything's in, a, in an order. That's the proper way things are created. And when you're climbing up the ladder of prayer, you have to also do it in order. And so, yes, if you have uh, personal needs that you, you have, there's a time and a place to do it and, and an order to do it. Now, sometimes, you know, things that are done out of order might actually not be good. You know, they're, they're, you know, you could say, well, I did it, so it should be fine. But you have to do things in order. So, for instance, you know, you have cases in, in, in building things or in computer science where, um, you know, A has to go to B, B has to go to C, C has to go to D, you know, D has to go to E. And if you're putting E before B, you end up with a computer program that doesn't run because it's out of order. And so the prayers are really like you know, computer programs to try to, to get the most out of your prayer. And so that's why, you know, when you're putting things out of order, you know, it's it doesn't fit in with the way the creation works. We see that there's an order to to the world. We see there's an order to the astronomy. There's an order to how Hashem created the world in 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 the first, you know, seven days. And just like there's an order in the way the, the physical and spiritual world works, you too should also um, be part of that order. And then when the timing is right, that's when you ask for those things, but you shouldn't do it out of order. It's not really the best way. And as the text here is showing, that you can see whether somebody's a Torah scholar or they're ignorant and the Amma Aretz and they're unlearned. So let's get into the rest of this part. And that, by the way, a big key for helping you to get, you know, your prayers answered. You know, one of the one of the things that people who are just, you know, getting into learning and people that maybe they don't know so much, but they want their prayers answered. And, you know, they say, how do I get my prayers answered? Probably the first response you should give them is that you should probably tell them here that, hey, you should do it at the right time. When you're going to ask for things, it should be in the right time and that there's a timing for it and you should start with this very basic thing to ask in the right time because the Ezra and the, and the prophets who helped to compose Shmona Esrei, they knew something that we don't know today and they knew how, how the heavens worked and they knew how you know, things would work with Hashem, with accepting prayer. And they they had special insight that we don't have today. And that really the first recommendation that you should make to somebody who wants to get their prayers answered is to advise them to start to, you know, pray for the thing that they need at the right time in Shemona Esrei, because that's a big key for getting your prayers answered. Now, there's other things as well. But that is going to be a good starting place. And it's very important to, to do it at the right time. Now, the Gemara is going to, is going to note a, um, an apparent contradiction about that Bryce that we talked about. And it says that 
you know, basically was going to be saying is going to be saying by teaching this later clause that one may not add to blessings such as the ones upon mitzvot of fruit, which are very brief. The Bryson implies, says the Gemara, but with respect to all other blessings, including those of medium length, one may lengthen the text. So this is talking about a very short one for blessing the fruit. Uh, again, Shimon Esrei uh, is not included in what the Gemara is talking about now. The Shimon Esrei, you should pray, pray for the things at the right time in the structure of the Shemona Esrei, and that's where you can lengthen your your prayer. Anyway, so those of medium text, says Gemara, one may lengthen the text, uh, yet by teaching in the first clause that one may add to blessings such as those of Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur, which are already very lengthy and implies, uh, it, you know, it implies uh uh, with respect to the other blessings, uh, those of medium length that one may not add to the text. So regarding the matter of adding to a blessing of medium length, the Brisa seems to be contradictory. That's basically what the, the Haredim is saying about this, this part of the Gemara. He's saying that, uh, you know, as mentioned, the blessings of Shemona Esrei are examples of medium length. So, you know, medium length, you're allowed to add to it, but you got to do it at the right time. And you could try to rephrase the Gemara, says the Mara Fulda, says the Mara Fulda uh, that the Gemara's question is as follows. The first clause implies that uh, one may may not insert supplications within the blessing of Shimon Esrei, yet the later clause implies that one may add supplications to them. So the... Um, the, the, they're going to clarify this, okay? So the Gemara is going to clarify, and Rabbi Hizkiah says, uh, we may deduce the meaning of the above Barisa from that which was taught in another Barisa, which states, one who lengthens his blessings by adding to what the sages composed is considered blameworthy, and one who keeps the blessings brief is considered by the sages, uh, by reciting only what the sages composed, is considered blameworthy. Now, here's what the Pnei Moshe says about this. This is talking about the blessings of Shemona Esrei, and it is improper to improper to tamper with these blessings, because the sages painstakingly cra crafted this text, paying close attention to the precise number of words that each of them contains. And the Haredim says that, uh, indeed, the Gemara states that the Shemona Esrei was composed by 120 elders, many of whom were prophets. And the, the Or Chaim is saying, uh, is going to give uh, reasons for the number of words and many of the blessings of Shemona Esrei. And you can find that in, in, uh, in 113, in chapter 113. So, there, there's this thing that the Shemona Esrei has was composed by prophets. There, there's precisions to the number of letters. There's precision to the number of words. There's precision to the timing. This is a computer program. And just like in a computer program, if you change lines of code, it doesn't work right. The same thing here. Now, one of the, the best things that you can do when some guy comes and wants to get closer to Yiddishkeit and asks, how do I get my prayers uh, answered, you have to explain that, that you know, you, you don't modify the text because this text is a computer program that's precisely calibrated to help get your prayers answered. And that not only that, when you're, that there is allowance for adding to the text for your personal needs, but you got to strike when it's, you know, when, the, when it's at the right time, you got to do it at the right time in that time where they let you add to it. So you got to be very careful about that to help you to get your prayers answered. And you have to be very precise about saying it. Uh, by the way, there's going to be something that comes up later on in Barahot in the Yershami. It's in the Yershami, not in the Bavli, but it's going to talk about things to concentrate on in the Shemona Esrei prayer and how to recite it in a way where you have a better chance to get your prayers answered. So 
reciting the words clearly with, with kavana and intent at the right time is also a very critical part to doing it. So really, this is talking about somebody who is, um, who is saying the words and not modifying it, and the person who is, you know, the sages would compare to be blameworthy is somebody who is lengthening. In other words, he's taking a uh, part about holiness in the Shemona Esrei, and he's adding his own stuff to it. So that would be somebody who's very foolish. And again, you're tampering with a computer program, and you're, you know, you're not going to get the results out of it when you play around with it because you don't know what you're doing. This was calibrated by prophets and, and Ezra and the sages, and they had special insight that, that we don't have today. That's why you have to follow it. But you do have a place where you can add your own personal thing, but you have to do it at the right time, and you have to pay attention to that. Now, there's going to be a, a related brysa, and that uh, it was taught, says the brysa, the emissary of the congregation who leads the communal prayer is recited to lengthen the Redeemer of Israel on a fast day by adding a supplication to it. So um, this is going to be, again, check the Rambam's rules on it. There are, there are, uh, there are texts that are in uh, Tanis in chapter 2, Halakha 4, that talk about what happens when, when the, the prayer leader uh, is, is helping with the, you know, the Shmona Esrei, and um, there, there's uh, different times where you can you can add uh, text. Now, the Rabbi Kanievsky in his Bior is gonna is gonna explain about this. He says, uh, in addition to the fixed text, the Shliach Sibor is supposed to insert his own supplication appropriate to the occasion. So there's room for flexibility. Um, and, and you have to know where it is and when it is. And um, it's very important to, uh, to study the Rambam. If you have a question about it, you know, study the Rambam uh, on, on, on uh, Hilchos Tenios, chapter 4. And it'll, it'll help to walk through um, the timing of, of each of this. Now, the Gemara is going to wonder why the Barista speaks of adding specifically to this blessing. What about the other ones? And, you know, the Gemara is going to ask, does this mean that, you know, but, you know, in the six special blessings that he adds to Shemona Esrei on a fast day after the Redeemer of Israel blessing, uh, he does not lengthen the text. Surely he's lengthening the text in these blessings as well. That's basically what it's implying. And um, the Haredim explains about this, that the Mishnah in Tanis in chapter 2 lists the texts of the six added to the blessings and it is surely appropriate for the Shliach Tzibor to add his own supplications to these texts, since the whole point of the special fast day is to petition for Shem's mercy, and these blessings constitute the heart of that prayer. So that's an insight. The Gemara is going to answer, and Rabbi Yosa says, actually he adds to all of these blessings, but it was necessary for the Tana to teach specifically that he adds to the Redeemer of Israel blessing, in order to ensure that you do not say that since this blessing in is, is in essence one of the regular Shemona Esrei blessings, the emissary of the congregation should not lengthen it on a fast day, just as one does not lengthen the regular Shemona Esrei blessings at other times. Therefore, the Tana needs to tell us that he is required to lengthen the Redeemer of Israel blessing on a fast day. So, the reason why, you know, you say, oh, why are we talking about this? What, you know, why are we talking about a fast day blessing? And so what the, what Rabbi Yosa is explaining is that you need to be talking about this lengthening here for the fast day blessing to contrast it to the regular Shemona Esrei prayer, which you do not lengthen at other times. So you have some lengthening that goes on. Uh, at this one time, but what it's trying to point out is that in normal times, you don't modify the Shemona Esrei text, you leave it alone, 
this is what it is. And, and only in the time of the fast day, and again, you can check the Rambam for the rules on it for the modern day, if you're going to be doing that, um, the Rambam is going to walk you through how it works for the modern day and, and, and how to do it. But the basic rule here is on the, you know, on a, on a different time, you don't, you don't change the Shemona Esrei prayer. Now, I want to get into one last topic that has a lot of depth to it, and then we'll call it for the day. So, which of the blessings of the Shemona Esrei, you know, are there, says the Gemara, during which one bows? And in recitation of the first blessing, one bows both at the beginning and the end of the blessing, and at Modim, where we thank you, and one bows both at the beginning and end of the blessing. And regarding one who bows upon the recitation of the beginning and the end of each of the blessings, we teach them that he should not bow except at all the places indicated. Now, um, you can get more clarification about this in the Shulchan Aruch and also in the Or Chaim in, in Halacha uh, 113, Safe 1. And basically... Um, we do not allow somebody to, to bow at the beginning or the end of uh, any other blessing uh, because um, you're going to have other people that are going to notice and they're going to get the impression that bowing uh, during uh, Shemona Esrei, if it's done you know, at the wrong parts, that you can get that it could be voluntary and then you could um, come to do it all at the wrong time. And, you know... The uh, Haredim points out about this that bowing more than the required number of times is ignorant, is arrogant. It seems to be it's is a very arrogant thing, and so you know we're coming, says the Haredim, to uh, to Hashem, and we have to be more exalted, and we have to behave ourselves, and we have to humble ourselves before Hashem. So that's that's why. The bowing is more limited in the in the in the Shemona Esrei. That's why we're not, you know, bowing fifty five times in the in the Shemona Esrei, where we're bowing at specific points. Again, Shemona Esrei is a computer program, and if you want to get the best out of your prayer every day, you got to do it at the right time, including when are you going to be humble and and bow. Now, the bowing is a very critical point. Because as it's going to come up later on, if you're not humble enough when you're bowing, Hashem is going to regard it as if you're you're like the snake, and and it's gonna it's gonna go to like the right kind of bend is is where like the vertebrae start to like you know become pronounced in your back, and that if you're not getting that sort of bend, then it's going to be like you know like you're a snake, and and it's going to be like you're very arrogant. And it's not a good uh, it's not a good way when you're asking the king of everything to uh, to help you. It's not really a, it's not really a good way to get help. So the Gemara is going to talk about a couple of exceptions of the rule. And uh, again, this is going to be talking about uh, for special cases like with a Kohen Gadol or a king. And it's also going to be talking about. Um, uh, a very a very special uh, person who had special insight that that we don't have today. So you have to take this in context. For you and for me, it's what we were just talking about when you when you bow. But this is going to talk about an exception to the rule. And Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Nachman says in the name of Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. A Kohen Gadol bows at the end of each and every blessing of Shemona Esrei. And as for the king, he bows both at the beginning of each and every blessing and at the end of each and every blessing. Okay, but that's not for anyone else. That's just for the king, and that's just for the Kohen Gadol. And so it's important that, you know, we're, we're pointing out that these are people that are, you know, more at a higher level. And, you know, you know, they have to be more humble. And so that's why, you know, the king has to do it at each part. 
But if you try to do it, you're you're an ignorant fool who is very arrogant. It's not it's not the right way to behave yourself. You have to you have to behave yourself in the right way, especially if you're going to ask for a shem for help. And you know what? The sages gave you the tools to do it, and you can do it, and you can get your prayers answered. And one of the key parts about it is 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 saying everything with the right timing and in the context of how the sages put it together to help you. Now, there's another version of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi's opinion, and Rabbi Simon said in the name of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, the king, once having bowed at the beginning of the Shemona Esrei prayer, does not straighten up until he has concluded the entire Shemona Esrei prayer. And what is the basis of this assertion? And it's the following verse talking about uh, and it was when Shlomo HaMelech had finished praying to Hashem his entire prayer and supplication, he stood up from having knelt on his knees before the altar of Hashem. So uh, the, the deep part about this here is, you know, which form of kneeling is keriah and which form is bericha. Now, these are, these are the, the words that are used in in uh, the kneeling by Shlomo Melech. Now, one of the key points about bricha is that bricha is not accidentally uh, put there. Okay, so there's Rabbi Yochanan says in Masechet Orla that in Masechet Orla, every time the word bricha is written, it's really bracha, and so. There's always an interplay in Judaism between bending the knees and in planting the vines with bricha and also points out, Rabbi Yochanan, that it's all tied to bracha. So what this is showing us is that it's very important for us to try to, to bow in the right way with humility and to bow our knees because this is part of trying to get bracha, and this is interchangeable with trying to get bracha, and you're trying to get extra blessing. And how do you do that? You're doing it by bowing at the times that the, the sages said, which was instituted by the prophets and Ezra, and you're, you're saying those words that they, that they wrote to help you get your prayers answered, and you're adding for your personal needs at the right time time. And this is the best advice that you can give to any person who's looking for help because your advice is right here in Berachot chapter 1, Halakha 5. Have a great day.